Armed bandits have abducted babies, nurses and security guards from the National Tuberculosis and Leprosy Center residential quarters in Zaria, Kaduna State. The bandits reportedly stormed the area from a nearby forest. They engaged police officers in a gun battle before they escaped with the victims. Gunmen expected to be bandits also um, abducted many students, about 140 of them, of Bethel Baptist School located in Maraban, Rido, Chukun, local government area of Kaduna State. Now, what is going on in Kaduna State? How do we stop it? Well, joining us to discuss this is security expert Bosinde Araikbe and Dr. Ibitro Kemi Korobo. He is a lecturer at the, and consultant uh, and endocrinologist at the University of Port Hacker Teaching Hospital. He's also the past NME chairman for River State. Thank you very much, gentlemen, for joining us. Thank you for having me. Great. I'm going to start with you, Dr. Korobo. Babies, health workers, I mean, this is the first of its kind. You never really hear about this. You hear about schools um, and, you know, um, either teachers being taken because education seemed to have been a big target of these bandits. And of course, uh, uh, but, but hearing that they've gone to hospitals to take babies and mothers, and I mean, even security guards, does this not worry you as a health practitioner? Because, I mean, that might just be the new angle for these bandits. Well, thank you for having me. It's a big pity that um, the level of insecurity in our country has generated to this level. Um, worldwide, in areas where you have conflicts, we've had cases where doctors, nurses, health workers have been abducted and even killed. Uh, so this is really not new. In Nigeria, this has gone on since sometime around um, 2001, 2002, we noticed uh, doctors and nurses being uh, banned. So this is not new and it is indeed a big problem uh, to the community to our, our country as a whole. We are very worried, really worried. Now, I, I know that um, for River State, there was also a time where doctors were being kidnapped, you know, over and over again. And, you know, it sent, you know, some sort of shockwave across, you know, the state. But now that we're seeing this happen in Kaduna State, who's to say that it would not be the new norm? Because we've seen that the education in that part of the country is being targeted. So students are afraid to go to school. Um, security has to be upped if not, you know, Parents don't want to let their children go to school. But where you're taking care of, you know, sick people and, and of course, doctors also and nurses need their safety. Why do you think that Kaduna State is now a soft target? Let's talk about Kaduna State because they, everything, almost all of the kidnappings, the highest number of kidnappings have taken place in Kaduna State. Why do you think that this is happening over and over in Kaduna State? I'll give you my personal view. Uh, my personal view is that there is lack of cooperation between the government, the security forces, and the community at large. Uh, you must understand that to ensure adequate security, you need community participation. Uh, you need the community to give the security uh, agencies information. And I think that that does not exist. The people do not have trust in the current Kaduna State government. And so they do not give the necessary information that they should. And then they appear, and this is the perception, I'm sure I'm very wrong here, but the perception is that the Cardinal State Government is, may not be doing enough when it comes to provision of security, uh, providing the right security personnel, proper distribution of this personnel to sensitive and key areas. And the danger of this is that the Kaduna State Government may find itself in a situation where the people start resorting to self-help. And that would be very, very dangerous for uh, the people of Kaduna State. So I think there's a perception problem there. You remember here that these bandits, criminals, or whatever you call them, uh, they are smart. They, once they notice that there is a lacuna, there is a gap, they sneak in and do their thing and sneak out. So the way forward must be a cooperation between the state government, the security agencies, and the community. The government has a lot of work to do to build trust amongst people living in Canada. Great. Let me go to Mr. Bostonde Um 
Mr. Rekpe, you are a security expert, and I'm sure that you have had most of the security persons I know are all talked out, but this, this, is, this is our new normal, and we have to keep talking about it. Uh, I just asked the doctor what he thinks uh, about Kaduna State. There are, there are pundits who have accused the governor of Kaduna State of being all talk and less action when it comes to dealing with the issue of insecurity. And the fact that people are still paying um, for their friends and family to be released um, by these bandits, uh, that this might also be what's fueling more and more of these abductions. What, what are your thoughts on this? Uh, well, my thoughts are always, uh, my thoughts are always different. As you know, I'm a security activist and consultant. So my thought is very simple. I heard that recently our country, the presidency, with foreign collaboration, were able to arrest one secessionist leader, Mazun Nambekani, with good intelligence, repatriated him back to Nigeria for trial. You see, I don't know that they have this kind of power. Because if they do, I wonder why this level of criminal activity still exists in the North, which is the backyard of the people at the head of our field. You see, when you, as a, as a people, refuse to train up your child properly, and you go outside to begin to correct other people's children, they will not take it lightly with you. Even if you are trying to do the right thing, all they will see is how wrong your child is. I think the insecurity in the North is a pointer of the fact that we, the government, do not have enough justification for any fight against insecurity in any detravelized area like the South. But however, it is my view that I think the people in the North might, one way or the other, be enjoying this regular menace to their society. I'm sorry, what do you mean by their oh, enjoy? I'm, so, I'm sorry, hold on, up. hold on, Mr. Raikbe. What do you mean by the Northerners are enjoying this? Because I remember, I have talked about this issue for months. I remember a group of people in Zamfara who were outrightly cursing out the government of the state and the federal for abandoning them. So I do not understand what you mean by the fact that these people are enjoying it. How are they enjoying it when they are the ones who are being kidnapped and they're the ones who have to strive to crowd funds to be, able to, to be able to get their people out of the hands of these bandits? How would they now, be enjoying let me it? tell you something about people. Hello. This I'm is listening. democracy. Majority always carries the votes. When majority of the persons are not speaking out, when people in positions are not publicly speaking out and taking actions that will make the government realize that this is a turn on their flesh, when only people without a voice are speaking, then I think the people are not that out, the, the people are not all speaking. This is democracy and majority carry the vote. So if majority of the people in these affected areas are silent, for any reason whatsoever, it means that the people are not speaking. When you say majority, when you say, I'm sorry, I have to take you on on this. When you say majority of the people seem to be silenced, where is your statistics? Um, did you do a poll? Have you gone to the North to find out how many people are keeping quiet about it? Um, and who are the hardest hit people? Um, and again, I want to make a case for those people. If the people are crying out to their government, not just the federal, but the state government, which is the immediate government, um, and they don't seem to be listening, how much more a government that is at the center, which is the FCT? So could it be the people are really speaking, but the government is not listening? Maybe it could be. Let me tell you something about this thing. I have seen a statistics about Northern crisis. I have seen statistics about the people in a particular place in the north. They don't have so much population according to our statistics, according to our national census, that they have a lot of population in these places. But when you say the people are complaining, these people are how many? These people are how many? These people are from a local government. What is the chairman saying? What is the members of the House Assembly representing them saying? 
What is this uh, House of Red member saying? What is the Senator saying? People whom they have given their votes to represent them. Why will these people occupy positions of government and they have not been speaking on a regular back to back, hitting on air, making sure they attract national presence until these challenges are solved? That's what I mean the people are speaking. This is democracy and we have elected people to represent us. When those people are not speaking in our favor, when those people are silent and they are, even if they are speaking and their voice is not heard, it is assumed and presumed that the people are not speaking because the elected representatives of the people have not taken it to heart, maybe because it has not started affecting them. And that is what I'm saying. So the people that is affected must do their best to ensure that all elected officers and officials that they have elected from the list councillor down to the senators are part of their voice, are part of every move they make. And until that time, we will not recognize what they are doing. What, what is going on there is inhuman. It's nothing of students making education useless. These are inhuman activities. And the people must hold the politicians that have been voted into offices responsible until they are able to find solutions because that's why they were voted to pilot affairs. Protection of lives and property is the primary responsibility of government and its elected officials. Okay. So if that is not done and they still have people in power, then they are not picking. They, should, they are not speaking. That's what I mean. Let's narrow this down. I'm going to go back to the doctor in a bit, but let's narrow this down to the governor of Kaduna State because Kaduna State seems to be the place in the news today. Um, it's barely two days, if not three, that the governor of the state withdrew his son from public school saying that, that his children are being targeted, especially that one, uh, being targeted. And then a few days later... Students are being abducted from uh, a school. Let's look at the person of Governor El Rufai. He seems to be someone who talks tough a lot. In fact, I remember, I'd like to quote him directly. He said that even if his son were to be kidnapped, he would not pay a ransom to get his son out. In other words, he was trying to dissuade people from paying ransoms to get out their family members, especially for the Greenfield um, situation. And, and we saw the you know, back and forth that happened. The majority of the parents of those students said they had to pay millions. They crowdfunded. Um, so looking at the person of uh, Governor El Rufai, what do you think the challenge is for a governor like that? And why do you think his state is majorly being targeted? Is it about the governor? Is it about the fact that people really are funding terrorism by paying these um, ransoms to get their family members out. What exactly do you think uh, is the case with Kaduna State and Governor El Rufai? Well, I think Governor El Rufai was a very wonderful minister of the SPP in his days as minister of SPP. But I think as a governor, he's still trying to be the minister of the Federal Republic of Nigeria and not the governor of Kaduna State. And that is why his voice allowed more on national issues and issues that concern Nigeria, forgetting that he is the governor of Kaduna and not Nigeria. I think all it takes is for his advisors to advise him properly, to understand that Kaduna is his primary responsibility and Nigeria should be a secondary responsibility. And if he will channel the level of energy he has, in terms of national policy, in the presidency, and in other issues, I'm sure you will have enough ideas and be able to create enough solution. So for me, I think it's all about uh, Governor L5 prioritizing the people of Kabina and serving them as he's supposed to do within his tenure. I think that's all I'm concerned with. And finally, back to you, Dr. Korobo. Um The issue is when we have this cases of insecurity were quick to point fingers at the federal government, were quick to say, oh, the security agencies are not doing their jobs. But we forget that the primary responsibility of our governors is to protect and make sure that our lives and property are safe. Um, I know that in River State, the governor uh, has put in place um, a curfew that starts at 8.30 p.m., I think, um, because of seeming insecurity also at some point, which I hope has, you know, come down to its barest minimum. But what role do you think that governors can play in dealing with these cases of insecurity, especially for health providers like you, who really have to, you're like essential services, 
Uh, if a man is involved in a car crash or let's say bandits attack, they need medical help. Um, how should this happen across boards? But how do governors, how should governors come in or scoop in to save the day? Okay, well, the first thing to say is that um, we are essential services. We're not like essential services. I think that we are the most essential services there is. So it's good to uh, the second part here is that when it comes to provision of security, uh, the security must span across not just the health workers, but indeed everybody else. Uh, because as a doctor, if I'm not at work and I'm out in the mall or something, my kids and we get abducted. I wasn't in the hospital, I was still adopted. So insecurity generally affects the doctor directly and indirectly and other health workers. So the security measures must be, you know, global, total. Now, uh, moving forward, I think first and foremost, the government must first set a clear policy when it comes to intolerance to insecurity. Uh, the government, the governors of the states must work very closely with the security agencies and they must work with the federal government. You know, uh, one of the problems we face in Nigeria is that our politicians don't understand that once you're elected, there's no longer APC, PBP like that. It's about governance and serving the people that elected you. So there must be a cooperation between the state and federal government. Uh, the government, the governor must have a good relationship with the security agents and heads of these agencies. They must have a close working relationship. And then, but more importantly, the community aspect. And I'll keep stressing that. There is a need for community participation in security. Um, I'll give a typical example. Where my private hospital is, is in a place called Obuna Valley in Port Harcourt. And um, they have a good vigilante here. I provide free safe, keep my staff safe. And, you know, we always, we are, we're sure that we're in good relationship with the community. And that way, if anything should happen, uh, and I go to ask the youth leaders and all that, I, I will get the answers that I need. And that's where community participation is key. Uh, so a stranger cannot come in to rob a house. He needs to have done some security assessments, you know, some homework. So if the community gets involved, the community know everybody living there, we can at least to the barest minimum, secure and protect it. So I, I think the governors must ensure that community must be Well, I want to say thank you to key. you. Thank you very much, Dr. Koroba. Thank you very much, Bosindi Araigbe. Thank you for being part of this conversation. Uh, this is an ongoing conversation. We will be back to have it more over and over until we're able to surmount this problem. Thank you so much, gentlemen. All right. Well, thank you all for staying with us. We'll take a short break. And when we return, I will give you my take. Here's my take. It's unfortunate that we have to keep discussing and talking about the same things day in, day out, and sounding like broken records because we have leaders that have failed us, leaders who have refused to hear the cry of the people as it may. It, it seems to, that, that all the cries of Nigerians seem to fall on deaf ears. Our presidents, our governors, the members of our National Assembly who are supposed to be representing our interests the interests of the people, but they, they, they seem to have, you know, missed the mark. They are now most importantly uh, interested in their own interests, where it would benefit them, and forget that we put them there. I hear somebody saying that, well, we didn't really put them there, so they have a right to do whatever they like. No, it is taxpayers' monies that pay for those hardship allowances, those ridiculous newspaper allowances, all of the monies that you're getting, it's our money, and so we have every right to get these so-called leaders to be accountable to us. But then it is also, uh, it, it behoves on us as Nigerians to not just rest on our oars and say, well, we throw our hands up and say, well, these people, they have the police, they have the army, what can we do? There's a lot that you can do. As a citizen, you need to impress upon whoever your member of the House of Assembly is, the member of House of Representatives, your senators, if we're asking for free, fair, credible elections and our leaders, our members in the National Assembly are taking us back to the dark ages, then we're not ready as a people because they know what they stand to gain and we will be on the losing end. Is this what we want as Nigeria? Well, then we cannot wait. We need to start now to pressure them to change that electoral act, 
to what it's supposed to be. An amendment is supposed to be for the better, not for the worse. But in this case, do we really know the, the things that are in that particular amendment? How do we get it to be in our favor so we can have good elections come 2023? I am Mary Anna Cole, and I'm saying the ball is in your court. Have a good evening.